And all of the fracking in our region is just decimating communities. It's yeah. like, it's actually sort of like debilitating when you read about it because you feel so powerless to like this thing that's been happening for so long that people just, even if they know that it's bad, they don't really yeah. want to like take the action or they don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to do it in a way where like we are with the global movement, but we're focusing on how to have like change at a state level yeah. and a local level. It's 7.30 in Pittsburgh. And we're on our way out the door to an interview. Oh, hi. <laughs> How did you sleep? Oh my god, it's honestly the best sleep of my life. Really? <laughs> that bed was so comfortable. In terms of actually changing the system from social capitalism to socialism, if that is what were to ever happen, like what does that actually look like on a governmental level? You know what I mean? Like, does the U.S. identify as a socialist economy? Does does Congress change? Like, I don't know. Especially like a three-party system. If it'd be one thing to replace one of the parties with the socialist party or something like that, but a three-party system is, is not how our system is built. So it just, I don't know, I, I had a lot of outstanding questions of like, okay, like I, I understand that this is what you see as the goal, but what does, if you had all of your dreams realized, like what does the day-to-day -day look like of how everything operates um, beyond just advocating for, for um, Workers. Yeah. 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 What most people understand socialism to be in a popular consciousness is uh, what the things Bernie Sanders is talking about. You know, free higher education, Medicare for all, a Green New Deal. These are things we desperately need. Workers need these things and we need to fight like hell to win them. And socialist alternative is uh, engaged in all those movements and all those struggles to win those things. But we think that fundamentally, all those reforms that we win under capitalism are can always be taken away. Uh, holding up to vote, that was my experience and how I actually, um, is part of my journey in becoming a socialist and being involved in the Bernie campaign in 2016. Um, even though I was only 17 years old and then ultimately like when I came to college and I still wanted to join an organization fighting for a better world and I didn't see that in the Democratic Party so that's why I joined Socialist Alternative. Um, but like when we talk about organizing these grassroots movements, um, it's also about incorporating young people who are starting to reach these conclusions about capitalism, right? Um, and are looking for a way forward. I think there's this perception that um, a lot of these ideas and what AOC and Bernie Sanders are putting forward are like too far left or too radical for ordinary people. Um, but actually, if you like talk to people and start with what their day to day life is, like what issues they're facing, um, as was already said, like a lot of people have to work multiple jobs. A lot of people have a lot of medical care debt. Um, and, you know, starting with those issues um, and working towards why those issues exist in society um, makes for, like, a conversation in which you can completely transform someone's worldview. There's really, like, a mood in Pittsburgh, I think, especially, like, among young people to fight back. Like, this is a working class city, this is a union town, and I think, like, that energy is really there. What I really like about people in Pittsburgh is, like, people don't take bullshit. Like, they want to, like, get down to business. Um, and I think that's why we saw, like, in Pittsburgh, like, one Pittsburgh was one of the first cities to elect democratic socialist um, leader. And I feel like that's like transmuted to the people here. There is absolutely a desire to fight back. Bernie Sanders should use his platform and his authority and his weight among millions of people to call for the creation of a new party. You know, he could do that if he wanted to. Uh, he should call for a conference of his supporters, his activists, his climate strikers, of trade unions, of social movements, uh, to discuss and debate the way forward. How do we take the political revolution forward? What's going on with you? Uh, not too much.
too much. You know, I was just uh, prepping for the day, and um, I was looking at impeachment. It looks like later today, or if, uh, maybe early Saturday morning, uh, the Senate's probably going to be voting whether or not to quit Trump. So, you know, we have the whole uh, ruffle about whether or not, yeah. But it looks like some key Republicans, like Lamar Alexander, who uh, people were watching on whether or not he'd vote for witnesses, uh, they started signaling that they, they're not going to support witnesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it kind of seems like for now, Mitt Romney is the one standout who might vote uh, with Democrats against Trump. But other than that, it seems like Republicans are sticking by them with their uh, their guy. I think the interesting part too is that all the senators have been tied up in the impeachment trial, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, they haven't been on the ground as much as they probably uh, would, would have liked to uh, going into the caucus. Yeah. Do you think it's hurt any of their campaigns that they've had to be in D.C. during the day and flying out to Iowa on weekends? And Do you think they would have higher numbers? I think that's an interesting question for you all to ask and to um, figure out while you're on the road. My guess is probably, you know, because uh, especially with Iowa and these early uh, primaries, a lot of it's retail politics, you know, it's how many people you can meet, how many hands you can shake. How many babies can you kiss leading up to the caucus? It's uh, a really personal thing. So I think that, you know, like Pete Buttigieg probably definitely has an advantage going in that he doesn't need to be in D.C. at the trial. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, with Biden, uh, Sanders, and Warren there, uh, it changes the, the dynamics a little bit, or quite a bit. I think it's also interesting because, like, let's say feasibly Buttigieg does much better than he would otherwise because they're not there to well, three of the main candidates aren't there um, campaigning in Iowa at this very moment. But nationally, like, if if Warren, uh, Sanders, and Klobuchar didn't, if they stayed in Iowa rather than going and re- presiding over the impeachment trial, their reputations would be absolutely shot. So I, like, I'm interested to see if, if Pete does do better because they're not there, how that counterbalances his potential success in Iowa versus the rest of the country kind of like acting the way they, they're giving the normal amount of support to the senators, Mm -hmm. whereas Pete kind of has an advantage that he wouldn't have gotten in Iowa because the impeachment trial was going on. You know what I mean? I I think it's worth to dig in further, you know, as you talk to some folks on uh, on the road, um, I think it's an interesting question, you know, and we'll, we'll see it play out in the next couple of days. Yeah, totally. What brought you guys out here today specifically? Uh, we just felt we had school off and we just felt like we should come and support this because it really needs to change. Have you guys seen any impacts of climate change here in your community? So this winter was so much warmer than like mm. the previous ones. It was so much warmer. We, I think we've only had like one snow. For the Green Party, um, one thing that we saw in 2016 was a big influx of people into the Green Party after Bernie got, um, you know, um, people felt Bernie was very robbed. Um, So there was like a huge influx and our party wasn't ready for that influx of people. So we're trying to be prepared for that uh, this year. Our top few priorities are 2021 local elections. Um, In 2019, we elected someone to a local borough council and um, we want to do more of that. Uh, It's sort of um, very winnable areas as long as we start organizing now for 2021. Um, So that's one of our goals. Another of our goals is to stay strong and active in the anti-war movement, which kind of got a recent burst with the Iran activity. Um, So we're really engaged in that. And we also have a couple of state house campaigns this year in 2020 that we're using to prepare for 2021. We were with the Pittsburgh Fridays for Future strike. We were talking to someone named Lee Indra, who has really been like uh, forging the path of Friday strikes and the climate coalition in Pittsburgh. I was just so inspired by Leandra. Like, not only was she just so beautiful and passionate, but it was just something about her spirit that was just such a fighter in her. So what I've noticed is that people more focus on like just the global idea of climate change and not so much like the fact that we can pass things here to really make a huge impact. Yeah. Then all of the fracking in our region is just decimating communities. It's yeah. like, it's actually sort of 
like debilitating when you read about it because you feel so powerless to like this thing that's been happening for so long that people just even if they know that it's bad they don't really yeah want to like take the action or they don't know where to start mm -hmm. so I'm trying to do it in a way where like we are with the global movement but we're focusing on how to have like change at a state level yeah. and a local level. I looked at her at one moment when she was talking about her experience and, and growing up and how, you know, her family has expectations for her and what she should be doing instead of what she's currently doing and I was just like, this girl is going to fucking change the world. For people who don't know, if you had to explain what a dress transition is in like two sentences, how would you explain it? Um, so I think people hear fracking ban and they think that it's just going to be one day to the next, a bunch of people lose their jobs, we go into a huge recession, and there's just like a bunch of negative economic outcomes. A just transition is um, the idea that we can put in training or benefits or aid to the people who will slowly over time begin to have to switch their careers to something other than fracking. We just happened to uh, strike up a conversation with this older man um, who was waiting outside of the city county building, which is like obviously a governmental building. And he was like, I'm really in support of what you're doing. Like, I really appreciate it. And we're like, oh, okay, thanks, meaning the climate movement. Um, but then we got to talking with him, and he was just speaking about the differences in opinion about how to actually go about creating a solution and, and making sure that. Pittsburgh, for example, and in um, Pennsylvania as a whole, fracking is a really hot topic. Um, how to comfort people whose jobs are dependent on that and, and ensure that they know that a just transition is possible. If people would have known what it was like in the 50s and how horrid it was and what it is now, it's made a considerable improvement in our society. But there's still more to go. There's still a, still a long way to go. And, and uh, when they get the technologies involved, with what they need to improve the quality of air, there's going to be more jobs that are created in the same light. So. A lot of people are really getting tired of dealing with these issues, and I think a lot of communities are not necessarily waking up, but starting to face the fact of, like, this job or this um, business in our town um, is affecting our children and our families yeah. in such an awful way. I mean, it's hard. I'm a child. I don't know, but it's it's just it's um. I think it can go either way. I don't know. I think for me, it showed that this is more of a nuanced conversation than I thought. Like I never considered opposing sides or or, or sides in general when it came to fracking. And so when I heard Leandra's point, and then I heard that gentleman's point. Oh, well, like, they're both kind of right, you know what I mean? So it's like, I don't even know where I stand, but I think what this experience today taught me, and I'm sure it taught both of you as well, is just that this is an important conversation that we need to be having, whether we know about it or not. Like, it's just, we, not, we need to acknowledge it and acknowledge both sides and say, oh, well, like, you both have points, but I don't know. It was just so, it was interesting. Okay, so this place behind us is called Randy Land. Mm -hmm. Apparently this artist named Randy just bought the whole property and turned it into this massive art project. Today we're here with the myth, the legend, Randy and Randy Land. We're here in Pittsburgh and we just had a couple questions for him. So I just wanted to start off and ask you, are you a Leo? Because I feel like this has very Leo chaotic energy to it, naming a place after yourself. What do you have to say about that? Well, what was your experience being here like? Like what made you create such an incredible and festive moment. I wish I could only do something like this. So what was your inspiration drawn from? Okay. Well, this has been such a great interview. We've learned so much here today from Randy and Randy Land. You see, he's got, he's clearly very busy today. He's painting up a storm, so that's why he couldn't answer. But we just want to thank you so much for your time, for your creativity, and for your passion, Randy. Thank you so much.
Pittsburgh to Akron, Ohio, and thankfully that doesn't mean the work has to stop because we've got this handy dandy little table where we can do whatever we need. So right now I'm researching our next conversation for tomorrow, um, which is with a woman named Rebecca uh, for an organization called C-A-N-A-P-I, Can Happy? Not sure, we'll find out tomorrow. I'm taking notes on the road, going to dinner, and then we'll be in Ohio. What's the review? I think it's really good. I do like the chicken. It tastes really, really fresh. A lot of fast food places can't really say that. It doesn't taste a little processed. It doesn't taste like, you know, it's a real chicken. This tastes like a chicken, you know? It has some flavor. It has a nice bite to it. It's not too crunchy, but it's also not, like, the bread doesn't fall off. So I'm going to go ahead and give it a 10 out of 10. Whoa! I will. I will. A 10 out of 10. A 10 out of 10. 